Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuing story of Animal Farm at Christmas. Animal Farm at Christmas. And the last words were they all cowered silently in their places, seeming to know in advance that some terrible thing was about to happen. Mm. And by the way, please subscribe and please share these videos. Thank you very much. Napoleon stood sternly surveying his audience. Then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. Immediately, the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear and dragged them, squealing with pain and terror, to Napoleon's feet. The pigs' ears were bleeding. The dogs had tasted blood. In a few moments, they appeared to go quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, three of them flung themselves upon Boxer. Boxer saw them come in and put out his great hoof, caught a dog in mid-air and pinned him to the ground. The dog shrieked for mercy and the other two fled with their tails between their legs. Boxer looked at Napoleon to know whether he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance and sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go, whereat Boxer lifted his hoof and the dog slunk away, bruised and howling. Presently, the tumult died down. The four pigs waited, trembling, with guilt written on every line of their countenances. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes, they were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meetings. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had been secretly in touch with Snowball ever since his expulsion, that they had collaborated with him in destroying the windmill, and that they had entered into an agreement with him to hand over Animal Farm to Mr. Frederick. They added that Snowball had privately admitted to them that he had been Jones's secret agent for years past. When they had finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throats out, and in a terrible voice Napoleon demanded whether any other animal had anything to confess. The three hens who had been the ringleaders in the attempted rebellion over the eggs now, came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited them to disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then the goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn during the last year's harvest and eaten them in the night. Then the sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged to do this, so she said, by Snowball, and two other sheep confessed to having murdered an old ram, an especially devoted follower of Napoleon, by chasing him round and round a bonfire when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot. And so the tale of confessions and executions went on, until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet, and the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the expulsion of Jones. When it was all over, the remaining animals, except for the pigs and dogs, crept away in a body. They were shaken and miserable. They did not know which was more shocking. The treachery of the animals who had leagued themselves with Snowball or the cruel retribution they had just witnessed. In the old days, there had often been scenes of bloodshed, equally terrible, but it seemed to all of them that this was far worse now that it was happening among themselves. Since Jones had left the farm until today, no animal had killed another animal. Not even a rat had been killed. They had made their way 
on to the little knoll where the half-finished windmill stood, and with one accord they all lay down as though huddling together for warmth. Clover, Murrell, Benjamin, the cows, the sheep, and a whole flock of geese and hens. Everyone, indeed, except the cat, who had suddenly disappeared just before Napoleon ordered the animals to assemble. For some time, nobody spoke. Only Boxer remained on his feet. He fidgeted to and fro, swishing its long black tail against his sides and occasionally uttering a little whiny of surprise. Finally, he said, I do not understand it. I would not have believed that such things could happen on our farm. It must be due to some fault in ourselves. The solution, as I see it, is to work harder. From now onwards, I shall get up a full hour earlier in the mornings. And he moved off at his lumbering trot and made for the quarry. Having got there, he collected two successive loads of stone and dragged them down to the windmill before retiring for the night. The animals huddled about Clover, not speaking. The knoll where they were lying gave them a wide prospect across the countryside. Most of Animal Farm was within their view, the long pasture stretching down to the main road, the hayfield, the spinney, the drinking pool, the ploughed fields where the young wheat was thick and green, and the red roofs of the farm buildings with the smoke curling from the chimneys. It was a clear spring evening. The grass and the bursting hedges were glided by the level rays of the sun. Never had a farm, and, with a kind of surprise, they remembered that it was their own farm. Every inch of it their own property appear to the animal so desirable a place. As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. If she could have spoken her thoughts, it would have been to say that this was not what they had aimed at when they had set themselves years ago to work for the overthrow of the human race. These scenes of terror and slaughter were not what they had looked forward to on that night when old Major first stirred them to the rebellion. If she herself had had any picture of the future, it had been of a society of animals set free from hunger and the whip, all equal, each working according to his capacity, the strong protecting the weak as she had protected the lost brood of ducklings with her foreleg on the night of Major's speech. Instead, she did not know why. They had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce, growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your comrades torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes. There was no thought of rebellion, or disobedience in her mind. She knew that, even as things were, they were far better off than they had been in the days of Jones, and that before all else it was needful to prevent the return of the human beings. Whatever happened, she would remain faithful, work hard, carry out the orders that they were given, and accept the leadership of Napoleon. But still, it was not for this that she and all the other animals had hoped and toiled. It was not for this that they had built the windmill and effaced the bullets of Jones's gun. Such were her thoughts, though she lacked the words to express them. At last, feeling this to be in some way a substitute for the words she was unable to find, she began to sing... Beast of England. The other animals sitting round her took it up, and they sang it three times over, very tunefully, 
but slowly and mournfully in a way they had never sung it before. They had just finished singing it for the third time when Squealer, attended by two dogs, approached them with the air of having something important to say. He announced that by a special decree of Comrade Napoleon, Beast of England had been abolished. From now onwards, it was forbidden to sing it. The animals were taken aback. Why? cried Murel. It's no longer needed, comrade, said Squealer stiffly. Beast of England was the song of the rebellion, but the rebellion is now completed. The execution of the traitors this afternoon was the final act. The enemy, both external and internal, has been defeated. In Beast of England, we expressed our longing for a better society in days to come, but that society has now been established. Clearly, this song is no longer any purpose. Frightened, though they were, some of the animals might possibly have protested, but at this moment, the sheep set up their usual bleating off. Four legs good, two legs bad, which went on for several minutes and put an end to the discussion. The beast of England was heard no more. In its place, Minimus, the poet, had composed another song which began, Animal farm, animal farm, never through me shall thou come to harm. And this was sung every Sunday morning after the hoisting of the flag. But somehow, neither the words nor the tune ever seemed to the animals to come up to Beast of England. A few days later, when the terror caused by the execution had died down, some of the animals remembered, or thought they remembered, that the Sixth Commandment decreed no animal shall kill any other animal. And though no one cared to mention it in the hearing of the pigs or the dogs, it was felt that the killings which had taken place did not square with this. Clover asked Benjamin to read her the Sixth Commandment, and when Benjamin, as usual, said that he refused to meddle in such matters, she fetched Murel. Murel, read the commandment for her. It ran, No animal shall kill any other animal without cause. Somehow or other, the last two words had slipped out of the animal's memory, but They saw now that the commandment had not been violated, for clearly there was good reason for killing the traitors who had leagued themselves with Snowball. Throughout the year, the animals worked even harder than they had worked in the previous year, to rebuild the windmill with walls thick as before, twice as thick as before, and to finish it by the appointed date together with the regular work of the farm, was a tremendous labour. There were times when it seemed to the animals that they worked longer hours and fed no better than they had done in Jones's day. On Sunday morning, Squealer, holding down a long strip of paper with his trotter, would read out to them lists of figures proving that the production of every class of foodstuff had increased by 200%. 300 percent or 500 percent as the case might be. The animals saw no reason to disbelieve him especially as they could no longer remember very clearly what conditions had been like before the rebellion. All the same there were days when they felt that they would sooner have had less figures and more food. All orders were now issued through Squealer or one of the other pigs. Napoleon himself was not seen in public as often as once in a fortnight. When he did appear, he was attended not only by his retinue of dogs, but a black cockerel who marched in front of him and acted as a kind of trumpeter, letting out a loud cock a doo before Napoleon spoke. Even 
in the farmhouse. It was said, Napoleon inhabited separate apartments from the others. He took his meals alone, with two dogs to wait upon him, and always ate from the Crown Derby dinner service, which had been in the glass cupboard in the drawing room. It was also announced that the gun would be fired every year on Napoleon's birthday, as well as on the other two anniversaries. Napoleon was now never spoken of simply as Napoleon. He was always referred to in formal style as our leader, Comrade Napoleon. And this pigs like to invent for him such titles as Father of all animals, Terror of mankind, Protector of the sheepfold, Ducklings, friend and the like. In his speeches, Squealer would talk with the tears rolling down his cheeks of Napoleon's wisdom, the goodness of his heart, and the deep love he bore to all animals everywhere, even and especially the unhappy animals who still lived in ignorance and slavery on other farms. It had become usual to give Napoleon the credit for every successful achievement and every stroke of good fortune. You would often hear one hen remark to another, under the guidance of our leader, Comrade Napoleon, I have laid five eggs in six days, or two cows, enjoying a drink at the pool, would exclaim, thanks to the leadership of Comrade Napoleon, how excellent this water tastes. The general feeling on the farm was well expressed in a poem entitled Comrade Napoleon which was composed by Minimus, and which ran as follows. Friend of fatherless, fountain of happiness, lord of the swill bucket, oh how my soul is on fire when I gaze at thy calm and commanding eye, like the sun in the sky, comrade Napoleon. Thou art the giver of all that thy creatures love, Full belly twice a day, clean straw to roll upon. Every beast, great or small, sleeps at peace in his stall. Thou watchest over all, comrade Napoleon. Had I a suckling pig, ere he had grown as big, even as a pint bottle or rolling pin, he should have learned to be faithful and true to thee. Yes, his first squeak should be Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon approved of this poem and caused it to be inscribed on the wall of the big barn at the opposite end from the Seven Commandments. It was surmounted by a portrait of Napoleon in profile, executed by Squealer in white paint. Meanwhile, through the agency of Wimper, Napoleon was engaged in complicated negotiations with Fredericks and Pilkington. The pile of timber was still unsold. Of the two, Frederick was the more anxious to get hold of it, but he would not offer a reasonable price. At the same time, there were renewed rumours that Frederick and his men were plotting to attack Animal Farm and to destroy the windmill the building of which had aroused furious jealousy in him. Snowball was known to be still skulking on Pinchfield Farm. In the middle of the summer, the animals were alarmed to hear that three hens had come forward and confessed that, inspired by Snowball, they had entered into a plot to murder Napoleon. They were executed immediately, and fresh precautions for Napoleon's safety were taken. Four dogs guarded his bed at night, one at each corner, and a young pig named Pink Eye was given the task of tasting all his food before he ate, lest it should be poisoned. At about the same time, it was given out that, that Napoleon had arranged to sell the pile of timber to Mr Pilkington. He was also going to enter into a regular agreement for the exchange of certain products between Animal Farm and Foxwood. 
The relations between Napoleon and Pilkington, though they were only conducted through whimper, were now almost friendly. The animal distrusted Pilkington as a human being, but greatly preferred him to Frederick, whom they both feared and hated. As the summer wore on and the windmill neared completion, the rumours of an impending treacherous attack grew stronger and stronger. Frederick, it was said, intended to bring against them twenty men, all armed with guns, and he had already bribed the magistrate and police, so that if he could only get hold of the title deeds of Animal Farm, they would ask no questions. Moreover, Terrible stories were leaking out from Pinchfield about the cruelties that Frederick practised upon his animals. He had flogged an old horse to death. He starved his cows. He had killed a dog by throwing it into the furnace. He amused himself in the evenings by making cocks fight with splinters of razor blade tied to their spurs. The animals' blood boiled with rage when they heard of these things being done to their comrades, and sometimes they clamoured to be allowed to go out in a body and attack Pinchfield Farm, drive out the humans and set the animals free. But Squealer counselled them to avoid rash actions and trust in Comrade Napoleon's strategy. Nevertheless, Feeling against Frederick continued to run high. One Sunday morning, Napoleon appeared in the barn and explained that he had never at any time contemplated selling the pile of timber to Frederick. He considered it beneath his dignity, he said, to have dealings with scoundrels of that description. The pigeons who were still sent out to spread tidings of the rebellion were forbidden to set foot anywhere on Foxwood and were also ordered to drop their former slogan of death to humanity in favour of death to Frederick. In the late summer, yet another snowball machinations was laid there. The weed crop was full of weeds, and it was discovered that on one of his nocturnal visits, Snowball had mixed weed seeds with the seed corn. A gander who had been privy to the plot had confessed his guilt to Squealer and immediately committed suicide by swallowing deadly nightshade berries. The animals now also learned that Snowball had never, as many of them had believed hitherto, received the order of animal hero first class. This was merely a legend which had been spread some time after the Battle of the Cowshed by Snowball himself. So far from being decorated, he had been censured for showing cowardice in the battle. Once again, some of the animals heard this with a certain bewilderment, but Squealer was soon able to convince them that their memories had been at fault. You are listening to Moral Bernard with Animal Farm at Christmas. Please join me for the next video of Animal Farm at Christmas. Join me for the next video of Animal Farm. Look forward to seeing you then. Join me in the next video. Okay, we're up thing. Bye for now.